A very good morning to one and all present here. A warm welcome once again to the day two of BA Convention 2019. I'm Sanchita and I'm going to be your host for the day. We have an amazing set of speakers lined up for today, so I hope you're all get up. John Elder once said, learning from data is virtually universally useful. Master it and you will be welcomed nearly everywhere. Data is that important. And today, we have a set of experts who are going to share their insights on the topic, essentials of data strategies, navigating roles, use cases, markets. On that note, I would like to invite our moderator for today's panel discussion, Mr. Krishna Tyagarajan, head data and analytics at Tech Mahindra with over 22 years of experience. A very warm welcome, sir. Thank you. To join him on stage, I would like to invite Mr. Harsha Rao, Head Big Data COE at Society General with an experience of over 18 years. Welcome, sir. And now we have with us Mr. Shrikant Panigrahi, Vice President, Analytics and Data Science at Decision Resources Group with over 17 years of experience. A very warm welcome, sir. Our next panelist is Mr. Debashish Bal, Vice President, Data Science and Artificial Intelligence at Fidelity Investments with over 28 years of experience. Welcome, sir. To join them on stage, I now invite Mr. Ramesh Mani, Director, Program Architect at Salesforce with over 15 years of experience. Welcome, sir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a set of esteemed panelists here on stage. So I request everyone to please give them a huge round of applause. Conversation. So this is going to be a fun session. And uh, we hope that this would be an interactive session. Uh, the way we want to take this forward is uh, uh, we will start some topics. Uh, we will, I will throw it out to the panel members to get their perspectives. And uh, we will take the discussion forward from there. Maybe for the last 10 to 15 minutes, if there are any questions, we will open it out for questions as well. Uh, before that, a quick uh, introduction from my side. I head the global data and analytics practice for Tech Mahindra. Uh, prior to that, I was with NTT Data for close to around eight years, was heading their global data and analytics practice. Uh, one common theme that we all decided was, while we have been in the industry for the last 22 years, doing pretty much the same thing. Uh, with uh, maybe a higher scope, more data, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's pretty much been data management, working with data. Names kept changing, database, data warehouse, big data, analytics, and what have you for tomorrow. And uh, I keep attending these conferences, and every time there is, a, there is some cliched thing that is thrown around, and others start debating about it. There was a conference that I went to where they said, data is the new oil. And in every other conference for the next six months, people kept saying, data is the new oil. And then Gartner came out and said, uh, no, no, data cannot be the oil, because oil is a commodity which is exhaustible. Data can be reused. So they said, OK, data is not the new oil. It is something else. So we, we want to try to avoid cliche terms here. And our expectation is that the audience takes back some very practical, pragmatic aspects that we want to introduce in this conversation. The topic is data strategies, uh, use cases, markets, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, in my experience, I have worked with various CDOs, CAO, CIO, and even the role in itself is a real confusion. There are certain organizations which do not have these roles but still keep doing whatever they can do with data. And a simple way, the analogy that I always use when we think of data management is Data has been there for a long time. And people have been doing forecastings, estimation, algorithms, AI for a long time as well uh, uh, that you must be aware of. What is it that the new technologies are giving us? Is uh, How is it that you can look at a much larger ecosystem of data? And how is it that you can get faster insights? Uh, it's like a sinusoidal curve, any forecasting or estimation. With uh, the crest of these curves, being information that we already know and which we consider for our forecast. And the troughs or the, or, the, or the bottom areas are where 
we don't have a whole lot of information and we used to make assumptions. With, with this whole new data ecosystem and technologies, the crest is now getting filled. So we look at aspects where rather than making an estimate that there are 15,000 people in this Rajaji Nagar area who may be tuning on to something, now we have data which can actually help us arrive at that number. So the whole data game is about filling the troughs and helping time-tested algorithms uh, really predict, move closer to accuracy, much more closer to accuracy than that what we were doing before. So those are some of the topics that I wanted to touch on. Now I'm going to talk to the panel members and get their perspectives on what they think about the topic. And then we will take it forward from there. Over to you. Hello. Hi. Um, so my name is Harsha Rao. I manage the Big Data Center of Excellence in uh, Societe Generale. Um, it's a French bank, if the name didn't give it away. Um, and uh, I've been in uh, data science for, I guess, the last 18 years, according to my introducer, which was very nice. Um, so broadly, this topic is actually a very fascinating journey for me personally in my current role as well as in my career. Because the way we started seeing data strategies, how it has evolved from my various experiences has been has been the key thing that I want to bring to this table today, and that's uh, something that I hope that you will get something out of that based on that. Okay. okay. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So myself, Ramesh, I lead the India Advisory Services for Salesforce. Uh, our team generally advises the CIOs at the CXO levels mostly uh, around the strategy, architecture, uh, uh, features of Salesforce, of products, uh, not just Salesforce, but also the enterprise architecture view, which largely brings in the data strategy as well. Uh, like our moderator said, data has always been there. Um, even like when I started my IT career 15, 16 years back, uh, when you're doing our initial presentations, uh, people always said, back it up with the data. Right? Anything you do, there is always a data. So the importance of data has gained uh, you know, uh, huge uh, importance now, for sure, no question. Uh, we are actually at an inflection point right now where every organization is driving towards an uh, you know, uh, intelligent enterprise, right? That's the direction everyone is moving towards. And I've done this with prior to moving uh, to Salesforce with Accenture for 14 years. Uh, we worked with a lot of high-tech customers uh, in the Bay Area. You know, that's exactly where all of these things comes out uh, in terms of how you use the data, all the technology that comes out first comes out in the Bay Area. So uh, I've seen it with uh, uh, all the high-tech customers, how they use it, help them to do the strategy there. There are cases where we define the, the one of the important things that you probably all uh, recognize it now is people have figured out how to collect the data. There's no problem with collecting the data. We have been always collecting it. Now there are more sources, and we also know how to collect from all the sources now. To a large extent, we also figured out how to manage those data. It's not that we don't know how to manage the data. Of course, there are some challenges around data governance, and people are trying to figure out what roles fit in that governance, et cetera. But apart from that, kind of we figured out how to manage the data as well. Now the next two step comes in where, how do you consume these data, right? Who are all the users? Who are all the personas who are coming to consume this data? It becomes an important thing now. And I don't think all the organizations have figured out. Uh, and there was a survey conducted by Harvard uh, Review, Business Review, and it said only 50% of the companies believed in the next five years, the current strategy of their data uh, will take them towards their intelligent enterprise, what they want to get into. This is only 50%. And the remaining 50% have even not even have a clue on how they want to do it, which means either they have not figured out a data strategy or they're not confident on the data strategy which they already have. So I think, uh, like I was trying to say, uh, we have figured out how to acquire and manage the data and not really know how to use the data. That's really where a lot of our focus is going to come, and that's related to this topic as well. What are the use cases? What are those personas? What are the markets? What are the tools that are available that's going to bring all of this together? The way we view the data, the way we view the projects that are happening on this data uh, is all going to change. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Debeshis, and I'm uh, part of uh, Fidelity Investments. I manage the uh, data science and AI team there. Um, I've been with uh, Fidelity Investments, uh, which is an investment bank. Um, primarily out of the US um, for now six years now. Uh, prior to that, I was with GE, um, their global R&D center uh, here in Whitefield. Um, spent about 13 years there, uh, working on a variety of 
analytics projects or analytics work for you know variety of businesses as you know GE used to be a very diversified company um, you know industrial healthcare energy capital etc um, and I have also spent some time with uh, a public sector called uh, Steel Authority of India Limited uh, in in my previous life um, so I have seen you know journeys across all these different organizations and uh, you know different uh, uh, different uh, business lines um, what i can say is uh, data has evolved uh, systems which use data have evolved uh, you know i don't know if uh, people uh, still remember the management information systems and uh, you know decision support systems and those kind of things that used to be there uh, which were also using you know data and bring out the intelligence or the uh, essence of you know how businesses can actually drive uh, some of the decision making and stuff like that um, this has evolved over a period of time and now what we see is uh, the the capabilities have actually uh, grown enormously right what I see now is uh, the, you know whatever used to take a long time earlier is actually taking a very short time now the cycle time um, uh, for you know uh, for information to be collected data to be collected uh, insights generated and actions taken that entire cycle if I if you may call it uh, the entire data to decisions and to actions life cycle has actually compressed a lot uh, which is which is a you know tremendous thing and uh, uh, in terms of uh, other strategic uh, implications uh, now you know people are coming out with a lot of products that leverage data and not only their usual line of business but they are able to innovate and come up with a lot of uh, you know differentiated services or products that can leverage the data and um, you know sort of uh, do a lot lot more than uh, than what they used to do um, so yeah so it, it is it is still evolving we have still not reached uh, i think uh, you know the end point uh, i don't believe there is an end point um, so a lot of changes are happening and a lot of value is uh, getting generated so that's how i see the data strategy uh, evolving Thank you. Hi all, I'm Srikanth. I hope I'm audible, right? So, uh, so I have around like 18 years of experience and basically specializing on the healthcare side. Uh, coming to my PhD degree, I've done my master's in pharmacy and then a PhD in market research, most into quantitative side. Then I started my career with the pharma industry, working for Pfizer for a couple of years. Then moved to IMS Consulting Services, again we specialize on like healthcare and pharma. Then moved to Mu Sigma where Hassa and I were together working on variety of models for pharma, healthcare, retail, as well as a few courses for CPG. Uh, after that, I moved to Genpact. For, uh, in that organization, I was for five years managing the data management part, as well as the analytics, and, and basically more into the insight generation. And finally, now for the last five years, I've been DRG. So DRG is a decent resource group, and we specialize mostly on healthcare information. Uh, we provide healthcare, pharma, then consulting organizations, uh, reports around the market trends, market insights. We also collect and aggregate data, uh, data that is more into the US healthcare side. Uh, so basically deals with uh, real world evidence data that is a claims data that, uh, which is, again, I can say the data oil now for the healthcare industry, uh, which serves like pharma providers, payers, and, and there are like other gold, gold standard data sets in the healthcare side which we deal with. My journey in the last 18 years have been really interesting because I, I basically starting my career with the pharma industry. I know that in the value chain, we have like variety of departments and each department has their own needs. Like a manufacturing department has like their own data needs compared with the commercialization side, which have their own data needs. Uh, then I moved to consulting side where I understood that whether it is like a commercial uh, project or a R&D project, there is a lot of overlap between these data sets. Uh, but, but just because data was not that big, so it was not being able to get like said across different departments. And each one had their own way of like doing a particular project. So if you talk about like a forecasting project, so each department does their own forecasting numbers. 
if you look into like manufacturing, they, they look into like how much products they have to develop, especially for like the supply chain to take it forward and then distribute among the different like outlets. If you look into supply chain, they look into like what should be the demand for different markets and then what should be the ideal inventory that needs to be maintained for each of the regions. If you look into the commercialization side, it is like marketing and sales. Marketing has their own like objectives of doing a forecasting exercise and then sales is mostly target generating and all those way they do, they do this exercise. So basically the same data with, with a different like another added data layer for, for their units was used to do this type of like process for forecasting. But after my movement to DRG where, where generally we, as I said, we collect, store, aggregate and then we do a lot of analysis around the commercialization commercial side, getting now into R&D. What I found is like most of the pharma companies at this age are looking into creating centralized repositories from where like different departments having like similar uses, let's take forecasting, can be able to access those like central repositories and then get that data set which they can walk it around and then <coughs> build, build those forecasting numbers. Uh, so basically I think the, the evolution that has happened in the last 18 years when I started where like data was very scarce to now where data is abundant and then you need to know which like data source you want to use. So, so what I would say is like most of companies are turning towards a single source of truth where like the same data sets can be used by different departments to get the, the, to get the numbers which can be justified across departments for, for building like different type of products or like uh, getting to the market or doing like different type of strategies. So that has been the overall experience. I think as we go, we can talk a few use cases. I'll focus more on healthcare side. Thanks, thanks, thanks. So you see that there is a there is a panel with a variety of experience. One coming from a system integrator side, then there are people from the product side of the equation, people from the captive side of the equation. So you're gonna get different perspectives. But the first question that I would like to challenge the audience uh, with is uh, the point that Ramesh had raised in terms of uh, the amount of spend that is getting into the data ingestion and storage versus the spend on the consumption side. Uh, there, are, there are some reports out there, uh, and, and uh, I may be a little off the mark, but today if you look at organizations, 85% of the spend is on the data preparation side of it, whereas consumption is around 10 to 15%. And the biggest goal for any data, data strategist is to move the needle away from the consumption, away from the data preparation side to the consumption side so that the value can be realized faster. So I'm just gonna throw it up to the panel and anybody can take a call on it. What, what are your views about it? How do, we, how do we accelerate the data consumption side of the equation? Sure, I think uh, uh, the reason why we spend a lot of time and a lot of money in collecting the data because we, the data is everywhere, right? Uh, from a services, for example, uh, if it's a, a digital service, digital products, it's very easy to collect the data. If there is uh, a physical product, let's say that's an IP phone, how do you collect the data from that, right? So you have to build in uh, uh, the, the mechanics within the tools to send the usage data to you. If there's a network equipment, how do you collect the data for it, for example? So I think it, it, it is taking time, it is still taking time for a lot of companies to build those kind of a metrics uh, within those tools. Uh, they're still collecting a lot of data. Whereas for the digital native companies, it's a lot easier because a lot of their services, a lot of the products are digital products. It's a lot easier to collect the data. For example, even for Salesforce, uh, the usage data, what we can collect and give it back to the customer, it's a lot easier because it's a software product, right? It's a digital product. Whereas with, let's say, uh, Cisco's IP telephone, uh, have we built all of those uh, mechanics within the tool? We have not, right? All the new products are getting built with those uh, kind of nuances in it. So now we started collecting the data. So I think a lot of the effort, money, all spent on that does make sense because that's how we want to bring in the data to the organization. Uh, even though the data has always been there, uh, how do you bring it? Uh, but now how do you accelerate towards this, right? So the foundation is now set, right? You need to start bringing in both the business aspects and the IT aspects together. Uh, we no longer want to say that there's an IT group which owns all this data. The big, I think the other point I want to add here is the biggest question that exists today is who owns the data? I don't think we have an answer for that from any large corporation too, right? There's a supply chain team owns the supply chain data. There's a CRM team owns the CRM data. Sales team owns the you know, sales data. So, uh, but we no longer want the individual departments to own the data. The only reason is we want to see customer as one customer. That's part of what Salesforce also does today is customer 360. We base customer experience as a center of everything and we 
built our products around it. So if supply chain looks at Ramesh, it'll say Ramesh money underscore supply chain, right? Sales will look at saying Ramesh money underscore sales. We don't want to see that. We want to see Ramesh money as Ramesh money. That's only one person exists. So that's the whole reason of bringing all of this data together from different departments into one place. Just a, just a course correction, all valid points. How do we accelerate the consumption side of it, knowing very well that, yes, the data needs to be collected and prepared and so on and so forth. Because ROI in data investments is something which has been an often debated topic, right? So if you could throw some lights on it, and in the context of new roles coming into play, how do you decipher these roles and their contribution to accelerating the consumption? If you can just throw some light on it. Sure, I think some of the quick wins for anything that we try to do, uh, start focusing on the quick wins. Uh, there are a system of engagements uh, where you want to run these insights and give it to the people, right? For example, if sales is trying to convert the leads to opportunities, we don't want to put this in a data lake and then try to take two days to process it and then send it back to them. And, and one of the large customer uh, in the Bay Area, it's a high-tech networking customer, uh, we framed a strategy around g gathering the data, processing, and giving it back. We are never able to get to a real-time data uh, insight back to the users. It's no point. Right? If, if you're running a sales, even before you start tackling that co uh, 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 the customer, the competitor has already acted on it because you it takes a lot of time to get the data back into the system of engagement. So I think you would focus on the quick wins, which data you need to do it within the system of engagement versus you want to do it offline and then bring it back. And as long as you start focusing on the quick wins, the quick win use cases, this is exactly why you want to bring in the business personas into it so that they will tell you what are all the quick wins that they can get. If, say, if I bring in a seller into this whole conversation around how do we co consume this data, how do I uh, consume this data the faster way, they would start saying that I only need these five data. As long as you give me this, I can run my business 80% of the time. Remaining 20%, we can always focus. So I would start focusing on the quick wins, especially bring in the business, bring in the users who are going to use the data. That way you can accelerate the focuses directly on the ones that are uh, going to be primarily useful, and then you start focusing on the other capabilities. That's my thoughts. Thanks so much. So just to add a perspective to this, the key element of the business side is, from a consumption of uh, perspectives, is what is the intelligence that they are getting vis-a-vis their own strategies and one of the primary challenges we face as large organizations is translating these strategies to measurable goals the moment we are able to measure certain things we know if we have the data or we don't have the data and that will accelerate consumption a lot faster knowing that either the data exists or being able to work with the right set of IT partners to make sure that we have that data and to a large extent I think uh, there are different versions of the same but we talked about uh, the data officers, and one of their primary roles is to validate that this data is right for consumption, which is actually a key question in large organizations. How much can we trust the data that we use? And so we're not sure about the owner of the data, but in a way, we need a certifying authority for the usability of the data, which is essentially something that can drive consumption a lot faster. So I can uh, give one of the real examples. And it's one of the process that we did for a leading pharma organization uh, for the R&D side. So especially on the pharma R&D side, there are like different data sources that are collected. And then each one within the department has a different usage. So uh, for example, there is like clinical trial data that flows like from different sites. There is like SA data from the medicine development cycle that flows. And then there are also like the patient real data that is a real world evidence data that also flows from different sources. So this organization wanted to assess whether they have the right data strategy uh, within their organization. Um, more importantly, importantly, around the data environment, whether the data can be used uh, properly or, or can be shared properly with a variety of the departments. So as you said, means they knew that the current type of like profiles or the people which are internal would not be able to, again, look into what exactly the, the situation is and then what transformation is required. For, for, for providing the right data to the right people in the right time. And that is where uh, this new concept called chief data officer that was getting introduced on the former side. So this organization hired a chief data officer and then uh, that person had like deep expertise around like different data sets on the clinical sides on the R&D side that flows. So, so they did a quick like evaluation of their data strategy versus like uh, their competitors and found that they're way behind 
the competition. So the first thing they did is like they did an internal survey asking to like different like people who are using it like scientists, then there are like business analysts and all those whether they are able to access the right data in the right time. And most of them said that it is so difficult to access data beyond their department for which like, they are unable to get the uh, customer unified view or the 360 view or what normally they look into. And thus were uh, they started looking into like, okay, what is the type of use case normally you have in a typical day within, within your R&D department. So they found like 50 different use cases, they collected those use cases. Based on that, they started reviving the data environment. And, and there is a lot of like linkages they started like uh, doing between these three different data streams that used to flow, which normally we call in the industry as probabilistic matching. Because you can get like 50% accurate matching and the rest 50% is all like eyeball viewing and all those. But there's a lot of like fuzzy logic we use to, to get those unified views. And after that, they also knew that it is very difficult to address all the 50 use cases with, a, with just a creating a centralized data lake. And that is where they provided an integration layer with like defined ontologies, which can help them like look into exactly what they're looking for, for the use cases, and then that expedited the whole data congestion process within the organization. Excellent. So, so uh, some key points which are coming out of this is, one is uh, the, the low-hanging fruits are the ones where we can quickly convert to some good value. And those were the four or five really good use cases that we can drive, which kind of begs another question. Uh, the strategy for an adoption, let's say you're building an enterprise data lake, we typically come across situations where companies embark on this journey of building an enterprise data lake and they work on it for two and a half, three years, the value is not realized out of it, and then they start another project to actually get value out of these data lakes. So, uh, the the top down versus bottom up approach. Uh, how how relevant is it in this industry? So you spoke about pharma, and Srikant was talking about an instance where they actually collected use cases, looked at what they needed on a daily basis, and bought that in. So th that's an instance of identification of the right use cases to take take forward. And Ramesh, you were also talking about relevance of data in real time. So. Devashish, if you can, when you are talking about this topic, if you can highlight those, relevance of data, ability to collect data in real time, and the top-down approach of data strategy, where you actually collect information from the users and start building from top-down versus bottom-up. Some insights from your side, please. Yeah, so um, in my view, uh, there, there are merits of both the top-down and bottom-up approach. Uh, now, one of the bottom-up approach, uh, how it really helps is, and it also relates back to uh, the previous question as to why we are still spending a lot of time uh, in collecting, sanitizing data, is that a lot of front-end IT systems are changing, right? Uh, new generation, uh, you know, front-end IT systems are coming up, and the pipeline uh, between those systems and data lakes, right, or the earlier version of data lakes, which are like data warehouses, warehouses, is breaking, right? Um, and that's a real ground level problem. Uh, and the uh, people who are close to that problem, right, uh, they will only be able to sort of uh, devise a, a solution around it or solve it. Uh, so one of the typical solutions that we see today is um, uh, define a data steward for a particular business process. So you not only identify uh, the earlier department-wise sales, marketing, um, you know, operations, but you define customer experiences, right? And that customer experience from end to end becomes one holistic business process. Sure. And there has to be an owner for that process, and that owner is the owner for that data, uh, anything you know, any data that is coming uh, into play in that process, that end-to-end -end experience. Uh, so he will, he or she will be able to uh, guide if at all that pipeline is breaking because of any changes, which is inevitable. I think a lot of systems are sunset, new systems come in, uh, and therefore a lot of changes is going to happen. But the, uh, you know, lot of elements like, you know, how do we define the metadata? How do we capture different attributes that goes into our, you know, decisioning systems, analytic systems, and so on and so forth. So that is, uh, I, I think, one mechanism. 
uh, which has to be bottom up. I mean, the top level cannot have a view into this. Where the top down approach is helpful is resolving politics. This is, uh, I, I would say, data is the new oil, but is also the new wealth, right? Whose data, who is the owner? Uh, you know, uh, Harsha mentioned that, you know, there is a lot of uh, ambiguity as to who is the owner, and sometimes that leads to a lot of politics. This is my data. I'm not going to grant access on this data to other people, right? Now, we face a lot of those situations, right? Uh, so in that case, a top-down approach is helpful. There has to be, you know, not necessarily, I mean, the, if there is a CDO, well and good, uh, but he has to have absolute authority of deciding, uh, you know, how to sort of uh, provision the entire data lake and uh, who will get access for what uh, reasons and what are the governing p policies and stuff like that. Uh, but if, if the CDO is also not there, there has to be some uh, top-down approach as to how that gets defined in a structured way. So in a way, both the bottom-up, there are advantages there, and the top-down, wherever it is useful. Excellent. And uh, there was one, one key point uh, from what Dave was mentioning about. This whole issue of data stewardship, right? It's, it's been around for a long time, and the owner of ownership of the data, there's a lot of, obviously, internal politics in the organization. But the way of looking and resolving this conflict by looking at the whole journey, right? Be it a customer journey, customer experience journey, I think it's a very novel way of doing it. So if that gets it, I, I want to make sure that I keep calling out some aspects which can get in, get be key in, ingredients of a data strategy. Uh, that's interesting. And you also mentioned about real time, uh, Harsha. How, how critical is real time information in decision making? And what are the tools and technologies that you have worked with? Uh, and some use cases uh, and outcomes, if you can share some perspectives. Oh, cool. The financial services industry has got lots of real-time use cases, but nothing compared to what we see from Google on a daily basis. Um, I guess everyone uses Google Maps, and everyone understands the value of Google telling you it's going to take you three hours, so don't go home or don't leave the office today. <laughs> but the reality is uh, pretty much everything everyone wants real-time right now, how are we actually able to provide that? So in many of our services and financial services primarily. The focus is on uh, the customer's uh, experience in multiple things. One of the key things that we are transforming right now as a bank is how quickly we can onboard a new customer. So when we look at it from you applying for a loan, which is more straightforward nowadays because of the amount of data that is available on your credit, to you're actually onboarding as an account holder from a bank opening perspective, which requires a lot more validation of your of your history, if you will. Uh, some of that cannot be done real time, but customers want that real time experience. And we, have, we are embarking on this journey, which is very interesting for us. So just, just to give you the context of the difficulty of that process, if you open an account, when you open a bank account, we need to understand if you are potentially a customer who is part of a sanctioned country, working in a sanctioned area of business, or you are a customer who is politically exposed, or you are a customer who is uh, potentially not somebody who is a good reputation holder for us to have as a customer. And imagine having to do that real time when we try to onboard you. But if we don't do that, we might even lose like the large percentage of customers who don't fall in that process. How do we manage that? How do we have the data ready for that? How are we able to bring that data in terms of um, being able to allow the banks to actually give that information faster to them? So that's a journey we are embarking on. Sure. As part of that, we need to have, obviously, all the data that we can have on customers. We work with third-party sources for a lot of these information to make sure we have that data ready to be able to take these decisions, if not real-time, near real-time. The ability to uh, take, take a probabilistic view on whether these customers potentially could be there or not, which is driven by algorithms that we use. Uh, we call them false positive models for industry jargon, but we want to make sure that uh, you have a very low risk of being a false positive. So that means you have a low risk of actually being a politically exposed customer or part of a sanctioned country or sanctioned entity. And so that allows us to take those decisions faster. 
So it's a combination of having that data and having those algorithms to do that. And I, this is something which is actually 15 years old. How many of you use credit cards daily? Pretty much everyone does. How many of you understand at a base level the number of algorithms that run every time you use your credit card? There's actually at least three. The first one is actually to decide if you are the person who's actually using the card. The second one is to decide if you actually have that amount that you want to use on that card. And the third is to make sure that the card is not being used in a way it is not supposed to be used. So all of those things, which the third one is actually coming under the gambit of money laundering or embargoes and sanctions, all of that has to happen in the 15 seconds you're waiting for that response. Right? And the technology to deliver that is actually very cool. Um, we need to have, uh, we actually have to work with uh, a lot of different integrators which allows data sharing to happen across things. So you might have seen that even with uh, HDFC Bank when you use your card transaction, how they transfer you from your entity to the bank and back. And sometimes you wonder why it's taking so long, but I think sometimes you should wonder at how you can actually do this on the mobile when you're booking a ticket on IRCTC and we're able to get all that things so fast because in a way we don't even understand what's happening behind for it to happen, but it's happening. And this is just three examples of what has to happen underneath it for you to get that information so quickly. Right? So in a way, the infrastructure has to be there and, uh, and primarily at the end of the day, the customer experience. Because if you don't feel like your transaction has gone smoothly, you'll probably stop using that instrument. So how much of that is where the bank is willing to take the risk to say that if these three things don't happen, I will still go ahead and authorize the transaction. Or I believe that even if these three things don't happen, you are very high risk and I will stop that. All those things have to happen in that meantime. So, so this kind of gets into areas of uh, real time, next best offers and so on and so forth that we've been working on. But a quick backtracking to what we started off with. So data strategy, we realized there are some elements which are critical. Corporate strategy is something which is basic to any organization. So when we try to link the corporate strategy and the data strategy, we started discussing about should the corporate strategy drive the data strategy, or given the digitally native companies, companies which have come of age in the digital era, should data strategy drive corporate strategy? So I'm just gonna throw this question out to the audience, and you can interpret this in any, any which way, but what are your perspectives? In a corporate strategy, under data strategy, when you're taking into account real-time data, single source of truth, outcome-based, consumption-driven, valency and relevance of data. How do, you, how do you see this whole strategy part of it uh, kind of transforming in the, in the world that we are today? I think uh, we don't want a separate railway budget, right? We want one general budget. So likewise, I don't think we, anyone wants to have a separate strategy. Of course, you need to have a separate strategy for each of your area. What's your sales strategy? What is your marketing strategy? What's your data strategy? It is important, but it should align with your overall corporate strategy. Whether corporate strategy drives a data strategy or data strategy drives corporate strategy, it doesn't really matter because end of the day, uh, you need to do sales. There's only three things that every organization measures, right? One is your revenue metrics, profitability metrics, and the risk metrics. As long as all three are covered in whatever you do, I think you're taken care. So I think they complement each other, uh, but you would start off with data strategy because no one really has a firm handle of the data strategy today. That's what we have seen from, I've seen from my experiences as well. Uh, one of the points I was trying to make earlier was, there is a, this is for a large high tech customer. We defined the strategy, we used, uh, we consumed the data. Uh, the system is live for what, like two, two plus years. And then we have to go back and redefine the strategy completely. And this happens for a large high tech customer who's sitting in the Bay Area where he's, he has access to the Googles and Facebooks and Twitters of the world, right? So I think even for such large companies have to go back and redefine their strategy. Uh, all the, uh, the legacy companies, you know, all the non high tech companies which are not used to this technology transformations, it'll take a lot of time. So I, in my opinion, they complement each other. Uh, it fits into the larger bucket uh, end of the day. Uh, but to start off, you would start off with a larger data strategy and over the period you merge it uh, to the general strategy. That's very interesting, interesting. Oh, and Any other perspective? Yep. So my perspective is very different because 
I come from a very highly regulated industry that is healthcare, and we deal with patient data, and patient data is always sensitive. Uh, so, so the way normally we have seen pharma organizations, payers, providers, so so the hospitals and all those. Uh, so, so basically, they follow a different type of like strategy altogether when it comes to data sharing. Uh, and, and basically, if like many of you would have gone through this paper, which was published by Thomas Davenport uh, on the data strategy part, they, where they divide into like two areas. One is offense strategy, and the second is defense strategy, or the offense data and defense data. So, defense data is something which like is very sensitive to the organization. Uh, and I being into DRG, where we collect like patient data. So, so these are like very sensitive. We cannot identify the end patient, especially. We have to follow HIPAA regulations and all those. Uh, and, and there is a lot of like measures we take that we don't get to that level. Otherwise, it's a, uh, it's a challenge for us. So, so those type of data sets needs a proper control. And also, the access to it, the sharing part to it also has to be prohibited. And that should be defined by the corporate. Uh, now, coming to the offense strategy is more of like the three metrics you're talking about, profitability, revenue, and all those. So that is something which can be accessed like across like different departments, although you would want like certain type of like filters around like different levels within the organization. So that data is something which can be again, again stored in a different way and then given access for a different type of like people altogether in the organization. So, so I think corporate strategy and data strategy teams, they, they need to work closely and have the proper understanding about which data is very sensitive. They have to come up with like a different strategy for like providing access, control, flexibility. And, and whereas, like, uh, whereas like the other data sets which they can make it like overall. The other part always is the cost, which a data team is not what, that much worried about, but a corporate is worried about. So, so that is something which we have seen now having a lot of like challenges just because the data storing capacity has increased as well as the cost in terms of like different uses within the organization. Um, so I think that is where companies have to draw their data maturity side. It's a, it's a pretty interesting perspective. In a highly regulated environment, where we are talking about GDPR and California regulations, uh, and the need to have access to data and the need to provide data, uh, currently there is a, there is a, I would say, an other cliche term during the, during the rounds, uh, data democratization and how that should be a part of the strategy. I want to throw it on to Dave. Your perspectives in terms of, you were talking about having the right kind of security controls and protocols in place, but still being able to give the users the data that they may want, both for a structured line of reporting and for experimentation as well. I'd like to hear your perspective, sir. Um, so this also relates to the previous question, right? Um, whether corporate strategy drives the data strategy or data strategy drives the corporate strategy. I think, in my mind, very quickly, the differentiator is whether you are, whether for you, regulation is more important or innovation is more important. If regulation is more important, then your corporate strategy will drive your data strategy. If innovation is more important than regulation, your data strategy will drive your corporate strategy. Um, now, the, the, the uh, current question that you asked me is more about the regulations, right? Uh, today, everybody is becoming aware of um, the privacy laws, you know, how uh, thanks to use and abuse of uh, data, personal data that we have seen. Um, now, you know, th th there's a lot of uh, activism about data privacy, data secrecy, and uh, so on and so forth. And as financial institutions, we understand the value right from the beginning, right? I mean, we, 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 we cannot imagine exposing our, our customers' data uh, to others. So yes, there is a strong need uh, to understand and evaluate what is the sensitivity of the data that you are handling. Either you're generating, you're processing, or you are using in your uh, decision systems. Uh, I would say, you know, two things. One is you need to make sure that uh, proper, uh, you know, data lineage is established. Unless you establish the lineage of data, where is the data coming from, where it is going, right? Uh, what is the real meaning of this data? Um, then you cannot just have any kind of uh, governance structure to sort of govern that data, right? So lineage is important. And the second aspect is a strong uh, governance structure. 
um, you need to make somebody really accountable uh, and, and give authority to sort of evaluate each and every use case. Maybe a little painful. I mean, you can take out the bureaucracy aspects out of it, whatever is possible. But I think somebody needs to have a good look at uh, the use cases, you know, how, how this data is going to be used, and hence the provision, uh, you know, access to uh, the right people. Only then, you know, establishing lineage and a governance structure can actually help uh, in, in this environment. Excellent, excellent points. Uh, so this is uh, this goes back to our age-old metadata management and how we used to look at both static data and now we are looking at dynamic data. This also brings a new challenge in place. Now with organizations, it's not just about internal data, but there is external data and the boundary is really blurring between internal and external data. Uh, in this kind of an ecosystem, there are some new things that are coming up. Data marketplaces where there is a provisioning for buying and selling data. Uh, and there are some new roles being created as a data vendor, like how you would have a product vendor in the organizations. Uh, and uh, so I would like to throw the question, maybe we have about five more minutes, uh, just to debate on this concept of data marketplaces. Today, do you see instances where organizations are geared for that? Let's say, as a data scientist, I may be looking at a specific data, but I may not be just happy with the data that I have in my ecosystem. And I wa may want to access data, not publicly available data, but really industry standard data, like in oil and gas industry, for instance. So some, some perspectives might really help on how organizations are structuring around this. So uh, as an organization, your business is focused on certain things, right? Any company would either manufacture a product or a services. That's your primary focus. So you can collect the data, anything around that, but there are certain things that's outside of your circle which you may not be able to collect the data, or not that your focus also. So I think uh, not just because they're, whether you're digital native or non-digital native, I think you may not necessarily have all the capabilities and access to collect all the data. So you always have to go to the marketplace. Why Survey Monkey exists today, right? Why do they have to do the survey while well, you can do the survey for yourself? So it's because uh, you, you, that's not necessarily your primary capability. That's not what you actually wanted to do. So you will always go with, uh, partner with, collaborate with other companies and collect the data. So you would get access to, I would think at least 30 to 40% of data for you to make certain decisions as you move forward uh, in your business would also come from the outside ecosystem. Uh, uh, that's my thought and I'll let other panels show. So um, it's a very interesting thing about you. When you have data, what can you do with it? How can you get, how can you get the value for that? In, there are two interesting examples that I've focused on in the last two years uh, in two different areas. One is uh, in retail. So uh, as a customer, you're very valuable to your retail partners. Uh, if you go to Big Bazaar or retail uh, companies like them, but how much of that information is actually valuable to them? They understand what you do, but they actually have a lot more value by taking that data and giving it to FMCGs because FMCGs don't have any perspective on you at a customer level. And one of the strategies for many retailers, especially in the US, is to understand how they can monetize their data because they have to deal with the Amazons which pretty much know everything about their customer. And for them to do that, they need to have a, a stronger partnership with their FMCGs to get the right prices that they can give. And sharing data is one of the way they negotiate great prices out of them because that is putting a value on their data for them, allowing them to have better uh, strategies overall with their FMCG partners. Another interesting thing um, is with cell phone companies, how they actually look at their customers. What is the data they can use with that? How about travel partners? Can the travel partners actually understand uh, airline companies, for instance, what is their market share of people going from Chennai to Bangalore or Bangalore to Chennai? How many of them fly? How many of them take trains? How many of them go by other modes of transport? How can they actually get that? by working with mobile companies. They actually can give you a much better perspective on what is that volume of data. And if a mobile company is actually sitting and saying, I am not collecting this data just for my use, I actually want to invest it as a business strategy that I can actually take and get a lot more value out of that, that sort of actually allows me to have a higher budget for my data strategy, a higher perspective on uh, getting that actually business out of it, working with other providers in the industry to have a body that will actually help me manage that as a global perspective. And Thanks. I think I can 
comment two lines. Uh, especially I coming from a data provider organization uh, as I'm working now. So I understand how much we need to be competitive, especially to showcase our data as better than our competitors. Uh, so, so if you look into a typical pharma provider payer setup, what like companies are looking is for like how many patients, for example, you have for a particular therapy area, based on which like they do a lot of analysis. So, so that is where I think a lot of these pharma companies look into the marketplace for different vendors who can provide them the best patient data for a particular therapy area, or like to do some type of like fraud, waste, abuse analysis for a healthcare insurer or a provider. So, so there are like a lot of like cross uses of this data what we have. But basically, just because they have to derive insights, and many of the pharma organizations are using the same vendor, and that is where this competition arises. It's how I can be better than that other vendor can provide the best insights. And that's where we have seen a lot of like tough competition coming around, basically on this real world evidence data, where it's like other data sets are much more common, and then can be. So, so, so this is there is a whole new area which is expanding. It's called data infonomics, where. Uh, Companies are trying to capture the value of the data. And uh, in future, there is a belief that they may even include the value of the data assets that they hold in the balance sheet. It's again something which we may get to see in the next five to six years. But definitely the value is there. So as Srikant was talking about, in terms of buying data, you need to make sure that you get the right bargain in terms of what you're going to pay for the data. And while selling data, you need to put the price tag to it. So we covered a wide canvas today, right from how we draw data strategies, uh, interesting perspectives in terms of why top-down, why bottom-up, should corporate strategy follow data strategy or vice versa, in which environment, and so on and so forth. I know that we can keep talking forever in this field. But uh, I'll just uh, summarize this by saying that uh, watch out for this area. Uh, while you're working on your data strategy, make sure that you consider the value and the outcome and the business groups which are going to be the actual beneficiaries of this as your key drivers. Uh, if we have time for questions, I don't know if we have time for questions. We can take one or two. Otherwise, uh, thanks I, a lot. I think we can take the questions offline if you all don't mind. There are two people who are raising hands if I <laughs> quickly want to address. Okay, I think one or two <laughs> questions should be fine. Sure, yeah, go ahead. So um, that's my job. <laughs> Broadly speaking, we are dealing with that. So it's not just legacy systems, it's disparate systems of the same legacy. And uh, so as a bank right now, we are on a multi-year strategy for that. The first part is whatever we are capturing in legacy systems, let's make sure we just move it parcel into our data lake, right? What are we doing in the next two years is actually the critical part, which is how are we moving the storage in legacy systems to the data lake. How are we able to move that real time, right? That is a transformation that is going to be critical. But every new application we are building off that has to be built off the data lake, not off legacy system. That is one way to force ourselves to do that. And to do that, we have another thing. We have to focus to make sure that all our disparate systems have a measurable data quality metric. And that is something that we are learning. And we are using it in gamification to say that this system gives us better quality. This system is not giving us that quality. Can you improve it? Can you tell us how to improve it? And this is where the group chief data officer's role is very critical to this business. How can we deliver the right data quality to the systems right now so that we know what we have to capture in the next two years so that our applications which are using them can be built off the new data lake that we have? There's one more question. Yes, yes. Hi, my name is Purushottam from Mindtree. Uh, would request to please suggest two focus areas uh, for a BA in a data domain project. Sorry, uh, focus areas for a BA, for a, for a a BA analyst in a data in project. In a data, data domain project. 
Does anyone want to take up the question? Uh, I'll probably give my spiel and then the others can join in. Um, one of the reasons I'm here in this conference is because of Ashish Mehta. So he was heading the business analyst group and I was heading the data and analytics group in NTT data. That was our previous avatar. And we always used to have this puzzle as to the date, the business analyst part, should it remain with the data and analytics team? Because it's a part and parcel of it. And when we are talking about this so-called imaginary bridge between the business and the IT teams, that, that, that gap is kind of dissipating as of now. And business analysts are playing a very crucial role. They bring the business knowledge and they try to look at the IT elements which can add value to that business knowledge. So highly critical. So in the entire data journey, a business analyst as a role is what I would put as the primary role in addition to the data scientists and data engineers. Because the business analyst is going to provide the catalyst for the data engineers and the data scientists to start moving in a specific direction. Any other perspectives, please? I'll just add one thing to that. So I was mentioning earlier that you need to start bringing the business users on earlier because that's when you know the real use cases, what personas you want to define for each data, how do we want to consume this data, et cetera. And business straight away coming to the IT world is pretty, like you know, they're learning Greek and Latin for them, right? So I think that's where you guys and play an important role. The business analyst are the most important folks in this whole, uh, bringing the business together in this whole process earlier, right? So you'd bridge the gap. Uh, you'd be like acting as a bridge between both business and IT in this case. Uh, so I think uh, your role gained more importance than ever before with all this data, uh, data thing is picking up. Uh, an interesting anecdote just to close that. Uh, in data strategy, we always do this data as a service, self-service ecosystems and so on and so forth. So we companies used to spend a lot of money and we as SIs will go and help them build those self-service ecosystems. But we found that the adoption rates were pretty low. You build these fantastic ecosystems, nobody uses it. Going back to Ramesh's point, the people and the users have to be educated on how to make the best use of these self-service ecosystems. So we have even started a service line to train people to use the self-service ecosystems, even though, even though it sounds as an oxymoron. And that is where the business analysts play a very key role. So they have to come in help kickstart whatever investments that have been made on the IT side. How do I start leveraging those investments and how do I start converting them to viable outcome? I think that's where the business analysts play a key role. So thanks guys, thanks. Uh, I think it was a good session. I'm honored Thank to you, have uh, been in this panel, uh, such an elite le level of panelists. And back to you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I want to thank all the panelists for the wonderful session. And I think we can safely say that after this session, we did take a lot of pragmatic and practical insights. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, I request you all to please give them a very huge round of applause once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. A small announcement.